Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest PV Tech Tech Talk product series webinar. Uh, this is Mark Osborne, Senior News Editor at PV Tech and the moderator for this webinar. Today's title is Eliminating Catastrophic PV Tracker System Damage Due to Extreme Wind Conditions, which will explain key aspects of a technical collaboration between PV tracker firm Soltec and specialist engineering consultancy firm RWDI. Now, this has resulted in Soltec's dye wind analysis tool to enable correctly designed utility scale PV power plants that plan deploying tracker systems in the new era of large area PV panels and especially mitigate the impact on systems vulnerable to high wind loads. Uh, we have two guest speakers sharing the floor today, uh, Bernd Zwingman, structural engineer at Soltec, and Matthew Brown, project manager and principal at RWDI. So a quick reminder that we will have time for a short Q&A session after the presentation. And so feel free to post questions throughout this webinar. We also have staff from both the companies online to help answer any questions you may have. Okay, so we have a lot of great info to get on with. Uh, so if both presenters are ready, Bernd, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction and welcome to the audience. My name is Bernd Swingman. As Mark already said, I'm a structural engineer at Soltec. In case uh, you don't know Soltec, here are some general figures. Soltec is one of the top three PV single access tracker suppliers in the world and the number one in Latin America with an installed power of approximately 10 gigawatts worldwide. This presentation will focus on the diewind method that Soltec use, uses uh, for tracker design. Um, using the diewind method allows Soltec to obtain wind loads that include all wind effects like dynamic pressure, dynamic amplification and stability. The method has been developed together with RWDI, today represented by Matthew, Matthew Brown. The experience has shown that building codes do not well predict wind loads for PV tracker design. Already the static coefficients for a tracker are not the same ones as for a monoslope roof, which are provided by the code. Also, the code does not provide dynamic amplification of the wind load depending on the activated mode shapes. And most important, there is a lack of information regarding wind-introduced tracker instability that can happen for eigenfrequencies of approximately one hertz and even beyond. That is why a better load wind load prediction method is essential. Diewind can predict wind loads on the flexible tracker structure, taking into account its geometric and dynamic properties like length, cross sections of the members, stiffness, mass, inertia, and so on, which can change from project to project. The obtained wind load includes a dynamic part that increases the static wind load due to resonance effects and instability. Soltec's tracker field is based on typically three different tracker types. The, uh, you can see the uh, uh, example layout on the right side. The interior tracker has a big share in the field and is usually very competitive. The exterior tracker and the edge trackers are stronger and they protect the interior tracker, especially when, they, when the tracker field is positioned in high tilt angles. The wind load Soltec gets from die wind do not only depend on the position of each tracker inside the field, but also depend on the different dynamic properties of each tracker type. This allows a very specific design of each tracker type. Now I would like to hand over to Matthew to explain how the die wind method works. Thank you, Bernd. So when we talk about single axis trackers and wind loads, there are several components that we need to consider. And uh, I don't know if you get uh, a little uh, uneasy with equations, I do, so this is the only equation I'm gonna show. Uh, we have several components. So we, we have inertial loads, 
represented on the first term on the left hand side of this equation we have the the stiffness which is the the what the structure needs to resist we have damping forces and then on the right side we have two applied forces uh, we have the buffeting which represents the wind buffeting so the applied force of the wind onto the structure and then we have the self-excited forces in the case of a of a flexible structure uh, and we call these aeroelastic forces. So moving on, we can see uh, what are the different dynamic effects that uh, affect single axis trackers on the next slide. So we have several mechanisms. First, we have what we call resonant vibration. And resonant vibration, there's two causes of this. The first is just general wind buffeting, so the applied forces of the wind onto the structure can cause resonance. But we also have when, uh, what we call wake resonant effect, which is caused by wind shedding from upwind uh, rows in a tracker field. And you can see that on the upper right figure, that there's increased turbulence from upwind rows. Now, there are two other mechanisms that we call uh, torsional instabilities, and there's two types generally. Uh, the first type is what we call flutter, and this is characteristic of high tilt angles. Uh, and the other mechanism is what we call torsional galloping, sometimes uh, also referred to as torsional divergence. And this is really characteristic of low tilt angles. And on the image on the lower right here, you can see that that these torsional instabilities cause the rotations at the free ends of the tracker, and they can become uh, very divergent and uh, excessive. So what is this hybrid method? So the components on the next slide, we can see there are several components of the die wind, and this is effectively a hybrid method. And the first component uh, uh, are rigid pressure model tests. So we get some data from those. So we'll talk about that. We also have uh, sectional aeroelastic model tests, and we obtain uh, different data from those tests, which we'll talk about. And both of those uh, kinds of tests provide inputs to numerical simulations. And these components put together provide a very flexible a design approach. Uh, for Soltech. And the first component on the next slide are, are rigid pressure models. And there's two main pieces of information that we obtain from this type of testing. First of all, we get static wind load coefficients. And the static wind load coefficients uh, represent uh, a rigid model that is assumed to be infinitely rigid. So it's, it's not flexible at all. And it's so stiff that you can't have any uh, dynamic effects. Now, we know most structures aren't like that. And so we can also obtain approximations to the inertial forces we talked about earlier using what are called dynamic amplification factors. And these uh, approximate the inertial effects and can be combined with the static to get an estimation of the total wind loads acting on the trackers. Now, there's one big assumption in this approach, and that's that the displacements are quite small uh, and they do not include fluid structure interaction or what we call aeroelastic effects. Now, the on the next slide, we can see the second main component of the die wind approach, and that's uh, a form of an aeroelastic uh, test called a sectional model test. And essentially what this does is it takes a, a short section of the tracker, which is nominally rigid, and we mount it in the wind tunnel on a spring suspension rig on both sides of the section, as you can see in this video. And that allows the rigid section to move aeroelastically. So we can rotate, and if it need be, it can translate up and down and uh, uh, side to side. And there's really one real key piece of information that we extract from this type of test, and we call those aerodynamic derivatives. And these derivatives describe how the total damping and the total stiffness of the system changes with wind speed. And due to the aerodynamics, damping can either increase or decrease, and stiffness represented by the natural frequency can also increase and decrease. And these derivatives provide the, uh, one of the key inputs, along with the pressure uh, 
data into two numerical methods. And the first is what we call a, a flutter analysis method or FAM. And this predicts uh, when the total damping in the system crosses zero. So really the critical wind speed of uh, an instability and a buffing analysis method which predicts the response of the of the tracker so whether it's torques or rotations this is the method where we really can predict the design uh, wind responses for for design now on the next slide i want to talk about a bit about the components uh, of the die wind now the components of the die wind are not new uh, what what is new and innovative of die wind is the combination of the components and i just wanted to highlight some of the roots in the flutter and buffing analysis within wind engineering and it goes back a long ways uh, so the flutter analysis goes back actually to the to the mid 30s with the work of theodorson and that work got adopted into wind engineering by uh, robert scanlon in the 1960s and this really was was motivated by the Tacoma Narrows bridge failure shown in this video. And this is a form of flutter. So this was really the driving force for the for the beginnings of wind engineering and, and long span bridges. And then the buffeting methodology that we use today uh, was was started uh, in its uh, infancy in the 1960s and continued into the 1970s. And long span bridges rely heavily on the buffeting uh, technique to produce uh, design wind loads. But one thing that, that is important is this buffeting uh, technique has been validated against physical aeroelastic model testing over and over again. Now, the first uh, numerical analysis is what we call the FAM or the flutter analysis method. And what this does is it predicts where the tracker becomes unstable uh, due to, to wind. And this can predict whether it's it's uh, torsional flutter at higher wind or higher tilt angles or torsional galloping at lower tilt angles can predict where the total damping crosses zero. And it's important to note that this is a mathematical definition of, of an instability. So it's not linked directly to a, a rotation or a torque, but it's where the total damping crosses zero uh, in terms of the, the onset, the critical wind speed uh, of an instability. And with that, I'll pass it back to Bernd. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Um, so we can take uh, these results uh, from the FAM method, uh, from the flat analysis method, and uh, plot them into a graph for different tilt angles. And of course, for um, Specific, uh, a specific tracker type. And uh, this curve shows at which wind speed the tracker with its specific properties like position, field stiffness, damping, length, and so on gets unstable. In the diagram, um, we can also mark the site specific design wind speed to distinguish between the stable and the unstable zone. In this example, you can see that uh, the tracker for this tracker is stable at zero degree. However, for small changes in the tilt angle, for example, by only five degrees, it becomes already unstable, or it gets it gets to, to, to the limit of the unstable zone. And we can also see that the tracker is generally stable for high tilt angle, like 45 degrees and beyond. In this case, for example, this tracker would be positioned at a high tilt angle, uh, for example, 50 degree to, to be stable during a storm. Then there's the second method, the so-called uh, buffeting analysis method. And this is, this is uh, much more interesting than the FAM because it's not only a theoretical uh, prediction of the instability, but it describes the behavior of the tracker in the wind. Because being in the stable zone is not necess uh, is necessary, but it's not sufficient for a reliable design. The tracker can fail without being unstable. And one interesting part of the Diewood method is 
that it can predict the dynamic load when the tracker is close to the instability limit. So the buffeting analysis method provides twist angle and the corresponding wind loads for the tracker moving in the wind. On the right side, you can see two graphs. So the upper graph is a tracker response where the tracker gets unstable because the amplitude is increasing with time. And on the lower graph, you see a stable response because the amplitude of the deflection is decreasing with time. This is an animation from RWDI where you can see how such a structural response could look like. When you focus on the arrows, you can see that they uh, grow bigger and smaller. Um, and this, they actually re represent the wind load that is acting on the PV panels. And due to this wind load, um, the tracker starts to move in the wind. And this, this is a, a realistic, uh, um, movement that one would expect in the module and the model storm event that you can show here, that you can see here. So how can we use this method now for the design? Um, this slide shows, um, shows this on the right side, you can see a typical diagram uh, that we get from the diamond method. On, on the vertical axis, there's the torque moment coefficient. And on the horizontal axis, the reduced frequency. F is the first torsional eigenfrequency, L is the chord length, and uh, V is the uh, design wind speed. On the left side of the vertical dotted line, uh, the design is not feasible because all, all trackers with, those, with these properties would be uh, unstable. The horizontal dashed line is the static moment coefficient that does not depend uh, on the reduced frequency. That's why it's a constant value. And the continuous line is the dynamic moment coefficient that increases the closer the tracker design gets to the instability limit. If you pick a tracker design with its corresponding reduced frequency, the torque tube needs to resist the moment resulting from the sum of both coefficients, the static and the dynamic one. Here you can see an example of the effect of the dynamic coefficient. The torque tube, uh, the torque moment of a specific tracker increases here with the wind speed. For high wind speeds, the dynamic component of the moment becomes significantly higher than the static part. This increase can be predicted by the BAM method, but not by only using uh, dynamic amplification factors. Recently, RWDI finished a series of full 3D air elastic tests to verify the die wind method. And Matthew, could you please introduce this work? Yes, thank you, Bernd. And uh, as Bern just mentioned, uh, Soltech has also undertaken full 3D aeroelastic model testing uh, with RWI. And if we think back to the animation that Bern showed uh, from the from the buffeting analysis of the the seven rows, and each row moving in reaction to the wind, so that represents. Uh, effectively a numerical representation representation of a of a 3d aeroelastic uh, type model and we can do that in the wind tunnel so effectively what what this type of testing does is it takes the full scale structure with its mass and its stiffness and its damping uh, and obviously its geometry and it shrinks it down to model scale and so in this photograph you can see one of the scenarios that we investigated with 17 rows in the array which which is uh, a lot in terms of uh, a full aeroelastic model and this allows us to look at we can change the tilt angles we can change the wind directions um, but really the the thrust of this research was to to validate the the previous buffeting predictions that uh, uh, Soltex has been using. And so we can see on the next slide uh, a comparison of, of one of those cases for a low tilt angle. So this graph is uh, presenting torque 
uh, on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis is the reduced frequency, similar to what uh, Byrne had uh, described before. The red vertical line represents the instability limit uh, as determined by the flutter analysis, so the, the FAM part of die wind. And then we have two sets of results plotted. One uh, is from the, the buffeting analysis, so the BAM prediction, which is the set of blue curves. Uh, and then we have the full aeroelastic model results, which is uh, which are the green set of curves. And there's three curves for for each data set. Uh, there's the mean plotted with the circles, uh, and then on either side of the mean are the, the 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 peak maximum and the peak minimum. And as you can see, the the trends line up uh, extremely well uh, as they approach the. The instability threshold and uh, the results uh, agree uh, quite well. So that's the response and on the next slide we can look a little closer at uh, the the critical wind speeds at these lower tilt angles and this is really an important to understand. So when we talked about the flutter analysis predictions, so the FAM, we talked about defining the instability uh, at the point where the total damping crosses zero. So that's a mathematical definition, but it's not linked directly to a, a rotation or, or a torque level. But when we go into the wind tunnel with a 3D aeroelastic model, uh, we can't easily obtain that, that exact point of where the damping cross is zero. So we need to rely on measurements of typically rotations. Uh, and when we do that, we need to pick a threshold. So we pick a threshold and where the response crosses that threshold defines the, the onset wind speed. And so we went back uh, and with the buffeting, used that type of definition. So a, a threshold of rotation, similar to what we used in the 3D aeroelastic model. So you can see this on the right hand plot. Uh, we have wind speed on the vertical and we have tilt angle on the horizontal. And the dashed line represents the, the flutter predictions. And then the, the solid line represents the 3D aeroelastic uh, results and the, the square dots represent, uh, oh, pardon me, the solid line represents the buffeting prediction and the, the square dots represent the 3D aeroelastic. And, and the buffeting and the 3D aeroelastic align quite well. And as you can see, the flutter gives uh, generally higher prediction. Uh, and that's due to just the difference in the definition of the onset wind speed. So with that, I'll give it back to Bern to, to wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Um, as a summary of this presentation, um, I want to point out that uh, Soltec is investing a lot of effort in wood tunnel testing and also the development of design method when it comes to wind load. And this is beyond the uh, requirements of building codes. It's much more detailed. And, yeah. based, uh, based on the results, the trackers, um, based on the results we get from those methods, the trackers, use uh, a high tilt stow angle position to mitigate the risk of instability. The flexibility of the diewind method allows Soltec to provide a specific tracker design for each client and each project. Thank you for your attention. Well, uh, thank you both uh, Bernd and uh, Matthew for what was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, before we start the Q&A, uh, I just had a, a couple of things just to remind people that uh, when the webinar slides actually disappear after the Q&A session, the actual webinar platform is still live. So we have uh, Soltech and RWDI staff available to answer more questions. So there's no rush to exit the platform uh, when the actual webinar uh, slides disappear. Uh, that's obviously to help you guys because it's a very uh, uh, complex and technical uh, uh, session here. So uh, don't, don't feel afraid. Uh, also, please note, sorry, but uh, Zachary uh, has had to go. Uh, he was on a very tight, uh, sorry, Matthew was on, on a very tight schedule. And uh, we have Zachary Taylor, uh, Senior Engineer and Associate Principal at RWDI to actually handle the, the questions for you. Now, uh, let's start, uh, let's actually start with uh, a question uh, for Zachary and RWDI. Uh, 
you you showed several animations. One of them was uh, the actual tracker uh, in a flutter um, condition. Uh, just to just to be sure, this was still model. It wasn't actually like a, a, a real scaled version of uh, uh, in the wind tunnel that that gave those effects. Yeah. So the this is Zach here. The animation that you're referring to, I think, is the one with the pressures applied. And so in that case, we exaggerated some of the rotation. So that's a buffeting response. So that could be below the stability limit, as Bern discussed. That could be just these are flexible systems. And in a, in a turbulent wind, you can see a lot of motion. And so it's important to understand the loads associated with that motion so that you can design accordingly. OK, great. Thank you for that. Um, one for, for Bernd, uh, the I think you did actually mention this, but maybe just a good point to just go over it again, uh, that uh, the question is really asking, you know, does Soltex stow at low tilt or at high tilt when, uh, when we're dealing with, uh, with the, the, this new knowledge and, and the trackers? So uh, in in general, uh, what you can see from from this analysis. So in general, you can you can stow at any tilt angle you want. Firstly, so that's uh, up to the up to the designer. You just need to know that if you choose flat positions, um, it's more difficult to to get the tracker stable. So you need to put more stiffness in it. Um, you can do it by, by using several drives, for example. There, there are such uh, solutions in the market. The, the, Soltec, the Soltec tracker has one single drive in the middle, the, the one uh, that is usually used, the SF7 system. And uh, this tracker um, has a stop position for high tilt angle. I think I also said it in the conclusion. So it, it depends a bit on the side and so on, but it's typically between 45 and 55 degrees what we choose as a, as a stow angle. Okay, um, uh, related to that, uh, uh, from, from a stow angle point of view, uh, there's another question here. Says, Does this uh, tend to increase the steel weight of rails, beams and piles uh, in the structures if, you, if you're having it at that angle? It's, you cannot generally say something like this. Mm. Uh, that 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 that's too easy. Uh, what what is what what is true is uh, of course that that uh, when you when you put when you put a, a wall in the wind, it you the wind is pushing much more on the wall than if you put a roof in the wind. Yeah, like a carport roof and the wall of a carport is totally different. But if you imagine that you are inside the carport with no walls, you are not very well protected. But if you are behind the wall, you're very well protected. So you could say that if uh, if you stole all trackers in flat positions, the interiors are not so well protected. But when you, uh, but the loads are generally, uh, for, for the outer row, the loads are smaller. But when you stole them in a very high tilt angle, the outer rows get very high loads, but the inner runs are much more protected. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's not so easy to 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 give a general answer on this. Okay, that's good. I think uh, there's a there's a group of questions, and maybe both of you may uh, may want to contribute to this. Uh, obviously, we're dealing with uh, larger area modules; uh, they are heavier. Uh, so there's lots of questions. Uh, sort of related to uh, we, uh, like, have you measured things like wind pressure loads on mod, uh, on these large area modules, especially in a in a two p um, uh, position, a two p um, uh, platform? So um, yeah, maybe I I can give a short answer, and maybe uh, Zach as well. Uh, so in general, uh, this method is, uh, so what we presented now is like general description of the method. Of course, we can, we can analyze any kind of width and length and so on. It's just uh, additional effort to say so. So we have, we have a couple of configurations that are covered by this method. 
but of course when you come up with a very strange type of uh, of uh, module then then you need to do some some additional analysis just to be sure that uh, that you cover this this uh, these properties but uh, the the method itself uh, is doesn't have doesn't have a limit just just the the numbers to say so that uh, that are in it for now but uh, we the, we don't stop so this is not this is not a history overview so this is what is uh, uh, what is ongoing now so uh, we go on developing further this method uh, Matthew showed the error elastic testing to to back up uh, the method and, and get some additional results on on twists and so on so that's um, that's a living method to say so so it will always progress forward so if we if we find that that we need new conditions to be tested then we just include it into into, into the scope and i can i can add a little bit to what Bern said there in his response um as you can imagine full 3d air elastic testing is quite uh expensive and complicated and one of the advantages of the Diewind approach is to get a, a better, a deeper understanding of the aerodynamics. And so while module sizes are changing, while other th factors are changing, there's a, a great amount of flexibility in the approach because of how well understood the aerodynamics are in terms of damping and, and stiffness that we can provide some insight on different module sizes, different other factors that might go in the decision making and then once we're getting kind of converging on an answer then we go in and do a full air elastic study to confirm all that analytical work understood uh, thank you zachary uh another one here for uh, uh for you band i think uh uh questions really asking about uh and I guess I guess this is is in connection to to the larger wave uh, larger modules. But is there a typical distance between rows that reduces the buffeting turbulence, for instance? And I'd like to add in perhaps that uh, you know the what are the design considerations for a PV power plant, especially when we're talking about bifacial modules and their orientation, uh, how that plays a part um, in how you uh, analyze the uh, the risks associated with high wind so in in general we always do project specific solutions you you i think you you understand that what what i said before in in the in the high tilt stall position uh of course uh, it's more beneficial to put the tracker rolls closer together. So the closer you put them together, the better the protection for the interior ones. Um, of course, there, there's there's a certain limit, so you can, can't put them like with one meter distance. It doesn't make sense, but um, you can put them closer together and you get some some better conditions. In case of bifacial modules, it's it's more complicated because when you get too close, then the uh, the additional yield that you get from the ground uh, reflection uh, decreases. So typically for bifacial projects, we would choose a, a bigger distance between the rows, but this also depends on the location and on the ratio between direct and indirect radiation. So in fact, uh, that's, that's a more detailed study which is needed to uh, combine combine the uh, advantages and disadvantages of uh, having more yield from the bifacial but maybe paying a bit more for the steel structure due to uh, uh, a wider row spacing so that's also nothing that you can just uh, generally say for for all projects it's always project specific choice okay um I think uh, uh, just to confirm, because there was, uh, again, there's a, a group of questions. So I'm looking at the time as well. So this probably will have to be the, the last question uh, that you can, can answer. But uh, when, when you look at 
because uh, I think this is something novel for people to that are, uh, are coming on board here about you know you do take all of this analysis into uh, consideration when designing a plant but I think there was a you showed in one of your slides there Ben that uh, the outer you know the the, the outer uh, rows would be strong would be inferring that they would be stronger and they would also that would also be analyzed regardless of the size of the modules and again people are talking about inferring the larger way for way uh, the larger modules that, that uh, we now have um, and I guess it's just a question of you know how, how is that designed in do you have to do that every time uh, or is there um, you know specific standard things that you've learned from that you could just automatically introduce I think the thing it's a couple of questions in there but it's really people going in and around that that uh, topic um, yeah, the, that, that's a good thing maybe about the Darwin method. So everything is numerically available. So we have uh, we have several uh, commercial software joined together uh, for, a, for a numerical process to say so. So we can more or less, not, not totally, but more or less automatically design tracker fields, um, defining a list of input variables, um, which is quite fast. Uh, but we can also, so this this would be what you say, like a general answer. So I, I have a, a list of project specific parameters, put them into a um, calculation tool, and then I will get a certain, certain tracker field. Um, but this would be this more generic. And then, of course, there's also the possibility to, to look at each uh, corner of, of, the, of, the, of the plant, of the solar field individually, especially when the field is not, you know, not, not all fields are rectangle, right? As, so there, there are a lot of very strange shapes. So in these cases, it makes sense to, to manually look, look carefully what, what, to, what to design there. Yeah, I, uh, thank you, thank you for that. And uh, yes, there is. I think um, uh, you know, there's a lot of sort of uh, other questions here. They're very specific to very sort of probably unique, uh, unique challenges some people are, are obviously facing. And uh, the whole idea here is that that you know the, you can cater for that kind of thing in advance. And I think this is something that people. Uh, I think are, are trying to uh, get to grits with, but uh, we really have run out of time. We've we've pushed the uh, the envelope a little bit further than uh, that we should do. But uh, I thought the questions were really good, and so thank you, Bent. Uh, thank you, Matthew, who's gone. But Zachary, thanks for filling in uh, at short notice, and um, thanks for everyone for watching. Uh, the webinar will appear. The presentation uh, will go on YouTube. We'll announce it to everybody that uh, registered. Uh, and you can uh, you'll be able to have the presentation as well as watch the webinar again because certainly uh, I'm going to be watching it especially uh, some of the uh, uh, software analysis and how uh, the trackers perform is uh, very incredible stuff so thank you all for attending and uh, that's the end of the webinar thank you bye-bye